Welcome everyone, Kostin here with my campaign overview guide for Nakari of the Demons of Chaos. Nakari's campaign might be the ultimate expression of a campaign that can be really hard, but if you're playing it well, you can achieve an enormous amount throughout it. Though, to be very clear, this is going to be a harsh campaign from the very start. But let's go over faction effects, lord effects, skill line, as well as how you play Nakari on the campaign map and what are the major downsides and positives of Nakari's campaign. So you get 25% allegiance points gained, 20 diplomatic relations with all factions, and 100% tribute from vassals. Now this is actually important because the version factions feel towards you is actually not the highest in the game. It's not like a minus 100 level that many factions may feel towards the beastmen, uh, for instance. And with that 20 diplomatic relations, that will obviously help you a great deal when it comes to diplomacy. Yes, diplomacy is going to be the key element to succeed as Nakari in the campaign. And allegiance points will just help you gain control of a pretty powerful army from an ally to really help you out. Nakari also gets 50% experience each time a new faction is fought in battle, minus 25% seduce unit cost, so you can seduce units easier with Nakari, and reducing enemy leadership by 4. On top of that, you further reduce seduce units by minus 10, also get Welling Prey, which reduces melee attack and melee defense of enemies, uh, weapon strength and speed, diplomatic relations with chaos, reducing core corruption because Corn hates Slanesh. Slanesh probably doesn't really care, it just goes along with it. That's uh, Slanesh. Enabling these attacks, which reduce uh, melee stats, basically. It just puts debuffs on units. Then you also have um, Rampage ability on en enemies, which also reduces their melee defense if their leadership is higher than 50% of base. Furthermore, you can also get Replenishment and Vigor if an enemy unit gets destroyed within 30 meters. This can be a bit of an issue. And you can also summon our larger Disciple Army. So there's a lot of potential when it comes to these mechanics. One of the fundamental mechanics for Slaneshi factions, be it uh, Nakari or Azazel, is the Seductive I Influence well mechanic. Basically, school. if you engage with factions diplomatically, human factions, elven factions and the like, you start building selective influence. Over here, if I desire? just go to Marafi and start the trade agreement by declaring war on the minor factions she starts a war with, then I'm going to start Naturally. building seductive influence with her because of the diplomacy that I'm engaging in with her. Master now, recruiting. there's a lot of potential here. There's the pitfalls of the vassal systems that you may have to deal with. See, you can forcefully vassalize factions. Basically, with Krace, if I take their capital and then come over here to their settlement, I can forcefully va uh, subjugate them and make them a vassal. So I'll gain a portion of their income, and of course, with Nakari, that can be a pretty substantial amount of income in point of fact. Let's talk a bit about this particular aspect. How should you treat vassals? Well, typically speaking, you do want vassals, but you're not like Archeon if you're playing Nakari. What you really want are powerful factions to be your vassal. So think of the Ulfwan situation, Alfarian, Alarial, Terian. They're all ripe for the taking. They're all ripe to become your vassals. You do start with a cult over here. Cults basically can give you more seductive influence as well as some other benefits as well with uh, the faction um, and this can help you forcefully vassalize them if you're building seductive influence uh, to uh, the highest level and you use um, uh, you're using uh, the dominate option which does cost disciples now another interesting thing though is that disciples are one of the main campaign resources I'd argue far more important than money in Nakari's campaign believe it or not see you can use disciples to dominate factions. You can use the you can press this button over here with the ten turn cooldown to proliferate cults around the world. And cults do require disciples to actually build the structures in them. And also, you can use disciples to summon a disciple army from the very start. This is basically a secondary army. If I just do it here, you should never do this, by the way, in turn one. There's pros and cons with that, but it's like you barely get any units here. But effectively, you're summoning an army. The way this Disciple army works is that it can't replenish, but it doesn't cost upkeep. 
Take that, Scarbrand, with your precious blood hosts. Yes, I think Nakari is the far, far better legendary lord when it comes to, the, to mechanics. Because, yes, summoning disciple armies has a cooldown, but you can get a lot of disciples throughout the campaign. Because every time you subjugate a faction, you gain, what, 500 disciples? That is a ridiculous amount. Beyond, of course, the fact that you can gain disciples passively, uh, especially if you're using some hero actions with Cultist of Sanesh. If you're using some cults, you can get a lot of these disciples, basically summon uh, some armies. These guys won't uh, disappear. Effectively, if you keep the disciple army, and it can be a full stack of troops, decent troops at that, if you keep the disciple army, within your territory with a very high level of Castellanity Corruption, I believe it's 80 plus, then they won't even take attrition damage. The gimmick is, of course, that they do take attrition damage unless you're in a province with high Castellanity Corruption. So on the offensive, they can be a bit limited, but on the defense, these guys can be great when it comes to that. They won't disappear from the campaign map, and you can just have a free mobile force to defend your territory. Not the best, but still certainly something to work with. So all, all of that is a ridiculous level of power when it comes to Nakari. What are the downsides? Because I've made the point again and again and again that the demonic factions in Warhammer 3 are the worst factions in the game. And they are. For many clear and obvious reasons. For Nakari, Nakari's campaign mechanics are powerful. They're good. They scale up. They help you build a massive empire. Unlike Mr. Scarbrand, you won't be running with just one powerful army. And to be clear, Nakari can beat Scarbrand in a straight-up fight. And let alone that you can invade Scarbrand's territory, summon a disciple army and just beat the crap out of him when it comes to that. It's not the same thing as summoning ten blood hosts, I suppose, in a single turn, but still. Um, but not only, does Nakar, uh, not only does Nakari have significant faction power, he can have a lot of allies, use those allied armies for the Legion system, and just invade the rest of the world. Like, Nakari can build an empire, which is not something that Kugaf, Kairos, or even Scarbrand can do as well. Nowhere near as good. Yeah, Scarbrand does have a lot more growth, but still... You actually have an economy. You can trade with factions. You can get a lot of economic output. And because, by the way, you've got the Slanishi corruption helping you control, you won't ever really face rebellions when it comes down to the situation as Nakari. Though you're always kind of teetering on the brink when it comes back because you actually kind of want to maintain your control below 50% to increase your economy, to double the economy of your base economic structure. But what's the downside? Because there is obviously a catch. There are two significant downsides when it comes to Nakari. First off, Nakari doesn't have good replenishment. There's no hero that replenishes when it comes to it, and you only have this particular structure, which is a growth structure that can give you a bit of casualty replenishment. This is a huge, far bigger problem for Nakari than you might realize because a lot of Nakari's baseline units are glass cannon units, capable of doing a lot of damage, especially with the devastating flanker effect, which doubles their charge bonus. But the problem is these units have very low armor. And here's a race that's actually ideally suited to counter Nakari. Yeah, the High Elves, because their basic spearmen are pretty good uh, at resisting charges, and their archers will tear you a lot of your early game units to shreds when it comes down to it. And the problem is Nakari can also struggle significantly in sieges, especially against a full level garrison with maybe an army defending it because the towers, the archers will annihilate you. In fact, I would say Nakari, if I were to describe Nakari in any way, Nakari might be the ultimate anti-chaos faction. I'm not joking on this because the units Nakari has would be ideally suited to fighting chaos factions, not so suited to fighting heavily ranged armies, which the High Elves are. So the starting position is really difficult to deal with. Like, you will end up at war with Alarial, Tyrion, and Alfarian. It's just a matter of time. You can speed this up, of course. You can uh, decide to fight the war on your terms, but it is a brutal early game, without a doubt, when it comes to it. So what you should do? Well, you should come over here, deal with this army, seduce the cavalry units, because there is a cavalry unit here, then uh, get money through diplomacy, like just go, for instance, to the Cult of Pleasure, get a bit of money, go to Elfarian, uh, tell Elfarian, hey, you want me to help you fight those greenskins? Great, let me do so. Get a bit of money through those kind of things, just money, uh, just a lot of money, seduce the units 
over here, uh, the cavalry unit here, and then try and seduce two archers and the garrison here, and win the battle. If you can't win these two battles on your own early game, this might not be the campaign for you. This is what I mean that this is the kind of campaign where if you're an experienced player, you know what you're doing. It has a lot of potential. The diplomatic potential, the trade potential, the ability of just dominating the campaign map is immeasurable. But the start is difficult and you're going to have to fight a lot of these battles manually. This is not the campaign where you go on any difficulty and you think you're going to resolve it because you won't be able to replenish the units and the units will take a ridiculous amount of damage and not resolve. In point of fact, if you're dealing with Nakari, it's one of the best strategies to bring two armies and just not resolve every battle against Nakari. Nakari has a lot of combat potential in an actual battle, but he's only got like five armor. Though, granted... Nakari does have 10% missile resistance when fighting against elves, but still, that low armor is going to hurt you a great deal. Powerful in melee, not so powerful when it comes to any kind of ranged unit. You do have some options of dealing with this situation, and that is, of course, getting Forsaken from a tier 2 barracks pretty quickly, though this is the kind of campaign where you really benefit from having the Champions of Chaos DLC to give you some more options, hero options, uh, unit options. I'm not exactly certain what this adds, but I've, I'm absolutely certain that at least some of these guys are uh, reliant on the Champions of Chaos DLC, uh, DLC to have. So, with that in mind, what do you do? You fight this battle, you win this battle, you then go to Alicia on turn 2 and subjugate these guys. This will give you a lot of disciples, you'll need them. Then um, you start recruiting a second, uh, you get the second army on turn 2. And you just start recruiting units. Hopefully some Forsaken in two turns once this is done. But you basically want to be very aggressive in this campaign. You don't have time. If you can't win these battles, if you can't win these sieges the moment you arrive at them, if you can't take out Katik and Krace very quickly, you're not going to be able to deal with Alfari and, and Terran. They will outspend you. They'll outmaneuver you. They'll have better armies than you in a lot of ways, especially on the defense. On the offense, when it comes to field battles, yes, you have really powerful flankers, really fast units so you can outmaneuver them, but your units will take a lot of damage. So you need to take out Krace, for, subjugate them, then take out Katik, subjugate them as well. You might want to get the full stack with Nakari and then summon a Disciple Army. That's the moment when you want to do it. And then with those, take out Katik, fight these battles manually, reduce the casualties, use the Seduce units on the archers in the garrison to reduce their combat effectiveness, but Katik is certainly going to have quite a few units. Uh, take Katik's cap capital and subjugate them here. So basically leave Krace and Katik with these two settlements. This is the best option you have in this campaign because they'll help defend your coastline, which can be vulnerable to a bunch of nasty neighbors like Bellicor or more likely Lu and Leon Kerr, who obviously doesn't like you all that much. Though again, uh, Nakari's aversion is actually not as high as some other factions. A minus 40 aversion, it's actually not too bad to deal with. Meanwhile, you're engaging with other factions diplomatically. You should not care about Safri. What usually happens in every campaign, like get the trade agreement with Safri, sure, but don't forcefully vassalize them. That's actually a really bad idea. I mean, there's benefits, of course, with doing it, sure, but subjugating for extra disciples is one thing. Using the dominate button is only something really that you should do against legendary lords, not against minor factions. It's just a waste of time when it comes uh, when it comes to it because minor factions don't amount to much. Though it depends on how you're viewing it. You could benefit from having a lot of weaker vassals as well uh, in your campaign. By the way, take Katik, basically reduce them to this element. So Krace and Katik will have a full stack each. Then with a full stack under Nakari, with a second army, with some units, uh, and recruit a lot of units, and a disciple army, march quickly on Elfarian. By the time you arrive on Elfarian, he may have taken the settlement itself, may have actually moved to Southern Avres, dependent on how the situation develops. He'll also likely have two full stacks. If you can avoid fighting his army in a settlement, then that would be great. Elfarian won't declare war on you so quickly, especially if you engage in the diplomacy of like declaring war on his enemy. He is going to be far less likely to it. You can't use the dominate option on him. He's going to be fairly resistant on that subject. Elves are, actually. Uh, so what you're going to want to do is take Tor of Rest, Winnicar's army, Disciple army, and Secondary army, get a bunch of Forsaken, have them soak the hit, seduce units, um, then take um, Trelinia, 
and then if Elfarian has taken this element, take it out yourself. Now at this point you do have a choice in your campaign. You can either continue to Lawfern to deal with Tyrion, who obviously will have control over this entire province, or you could take the view that, well, Noctilus is going to put pressure on Tyrion, and Tyrion's, so Tyrion's going to be a bit distracted. And if you do decide to fight Tyrion, the pitfall that you're going to fall into is that Alariel is going to come over here, take the shrine over there, reduce your economy, reduce your unit rec recruitment. So after forcefully subjugating Elfarian and actually selling Tor of Rest and Trelina and even the capital of Kutik to him, so he actually is more useful as a vassal, it might be in your best interest to march your armies all the way back here. You do want to establish some di Words diplomatic relations with these guys, but I do emphasize me. that these guys should not be long for this world. Eventually, basically, you just want to uh, uh, end those diplomatic relations, or you can just wait until Alariel wipes them out, because she will. If you can get the Sword of Cain on Nakari, that would actually be significant, though it would also be a significant downside, because you do want to engage with diplomacy with other factions, and the Sword of Cain does affect your diplomatic standing. I feel like invading from the north is the better idea, forcefully subjugating Alariel, taking Safri by military force. Actually, by the time you arrive there, Tyrion should have dealt with Safri on his own, so you just take it from him and then dealing with Lawfern. And then after that, well, it's really up to you. Start building those diplomatic relations with uh, Marafi, dominate her as well. That's for legendary lords you get in this campaign. Archeon may have a lot of vassals, but him getting four legendary lords in the relative early game is ridiculous. So you need to destroy or vassalize these factions, and you also need to take control of the Shrine of Asurian, or have Tarion keep control of it, basically. Um, what territory... And you want to balance out between taking territory yourself and holding it for your economy, or giving it to your vassals. I would argue that having Lawfern under your the con direct control would be the best idea. So, one of the things you can do is just leave Tyrion with the Shrine of Asurian. Uh, leave Tyrion with the with some of these settlements. Uh, with these two settlements. Or take the settlement, the March on Lawfern, take the Tower of Lycian. Uh, and then, uh, sell Tyrion Safri. Get the... Uh, uh, sell uh, Tyrion Safri. Or, if he's got Port Elastor in, in Safri, one of the things you might want to do is just bypass it, march directly on offer, and hell, maybe even go via the sea directly from the Gaean Vale when you arrive there, take this entire province, and then give Tyrion Safari, because um, Lawfern is a really, really good province. You want your vassals to be powerful, but you also want the good provinces for yourself, so having Lawfern under your direct control is great. Then annihilate Noctilus. Um, annihilate uh, Noctilus when it comes to the, to the campaign. Um, maybe give um, take Kalidor for yourself, take Terranoc for yourself. Do that balancing act between subjugating factions and getting their territory for yourself. I would probably subjugate um, Elarian and Terranoc, but basically leave them with just the gates, right? The Griffin Gate or the Eagle Gate, right? And take their territory for myself. Or Elarian can, you can leave Elarian. Alarian itself, but Terranox province is pretty good, though you could always leave the, uh, give them Kalidor as well. Kalidor is likely going to be wiped out by the time you arrive. Uh, what you do after that is really up to you. You have a bunch of decisions, you just need to control Ulfwan in order to achieve your long campaign victory conditions, and of course dealing with that. My advice would probably be to head north, actually. Meet Sigvald, engage diplomacy with, with him, but really lots of possibilities. Nakari's campaign is really brutal in the early game, but once you overcome that, you're basically the dominant faction in the world and no one can stop him. And at that point, I would say you should embark on a little expedition, really. Start moving along the way, vassalizing factions along the way, the major ones at least. And then pay Scarbrand a visit. Show him who is the real uh, powerful demonic faction in the entire game, because it sure as shit ain't him when it comes down to it. Now, maybe I just value campaign mechanics far more than army abilities. Um, though Nakari is certainly no slouch when it comes to combat ability. The amount of damage this guy can do is a bit insane, especially with those magical attacks, the armor-piercing damage uh, when it comes to it. Also, the questing item he can get, uh, the quest item he can, uh, he can get as well. So lots of power, lots of potential, but also a lot of pitfalls in the campaign because your army is weak. 
So let's talk a bit about the army situation though, because you can make a good army. Forsaken are going to be pretty decent. You yours are going to have devastating flanker. Uh, the reason you want Forsaken is because the armor, so they'll take far less damage, and they'll still be pretty damn good in melee, right? You, you're not going to struggle with that. Uh, cavalry wise, obviously cavalry is one of the main strengths uh, that Akari has, like between Chaos Knights, Heart Seekers, you name it. You have good cavalry. You have really good cavalry. Though the problem is there. Fairly vulnerable. They're they're basically charged cavalry when it comes to Nakari. Um, late game though, um, getting chosen would be really the play. Just regular chosen would be the play because they're very very durable units with some high damage units like cavalry or soul grinders or anything you want like keeper of secrets. Make an entire stack of keeper of secrets. You certainly will be able uh, to afford it. Conquer the world. Deal with the end game crisis. That is Nakari's campaign situation. In a nutshell, those are the pros, those are the cons. This is certainly a campaign that can feel very rewarding if you know what you're doing, but also incredibly frustrating because, one, you're going to have to fight a lot of battles in the early game. The early game situation is brutal. Um, and the thing is, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a great campaign either because you deal with the early game situation and just become so overwhelmingly powerful be just your vassals alone could conquer the world for you the fact you're there helping them along just makes things far easier and more ridiculous so that's uh that's the, that's the situation you have when nakari the most powerful demon of chaos in the entire game